Welcome to the Mormon Yeshiva. This is part eight in our Beholding Eternity series where we are exploring the prophetic book of Helaman. In this particular uh, episode, we are going to discuss faith and spiritual creation, which is the backdrop behind the meditations or bonding discipline contained in the book of Helaman. Before we begin, please make note of our fair use disclaimer. Again, all the things here are used only as for educational purposes, and we hope that you will take the, the, the content and video in the spirit in which it was intended. As we've discussed in the Book of Helaman up to now, we've discussed, we've discussed uh, how ancient prophetic disciplines were encoded into the text of the Book of Mormon, one of which is the discipline of bonding with God and or what we would call modernly meditation. These particular meditations are all based and centered uh, in the idea of faith and spiritual creation. Everything in, faith, in regards to faith and spiritual creation and the backdrop behind all of these disciplines goes back to Genesis 1. And the concept behind it is that all things are created spiritually before they physically manifest. In other words, all things are created spiritually before they were physically. And we, this is why Genesis chapter 1 in the Israelite mindset is considered the foundational text of faith throughout all of the scriptures. If we want to understand faith, we have to understand Genesis 1. Why? Because Genesis 1 is the pattern for spiritual creation. And this is the real and much more full definition and more ancient definition of faith it is an act of spiritual creation. So let's take a look at Moses and some of the teachings he said, which I find in Moses chapter 3, the actual, uh, the, the one of the best descriptions here, uh, where he says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb in the, of the field before it grew. For I, the Lord God, created all things of which I have spoken spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. For I, the Lord God, had not caused it to rain upon the face of the earth. And I, the Lord God, had created all the children of men, and not yet a man to till the ground. For in heaven created I them, and there was not yet flesh upon the earth, neither in the water, neither in the air. And this is Moses 3, 5. Again, this is the idea that behind all acts of faith and also spiritual bonding, meditation, these concepts all go back to the idea of Genesis 1, that all things are created spiritually. This is why Genesis 1 was such a, a uh, foundational text for all other scriptures, because in it contains the pattern of spiritual manifestation of creation, or faith. So faith and spiritual creation are pretty much one and the same. Now, the word faith, amen, or emunah, faithfulness, you know, we talk about it being trusting loyalty or an act of uh, mental belief. And those are aspects that are play into the definition. But in reality, the greater definition and the, and the, the most uh, correct definition that is foundational to all of our scriptures it is related to the creation epic in Genesis chapter 1. Because faith is spiritual creation. Spiritual creation is faith. Now let's take a look. If we talk about faith and the idea of uh, you know, being an, an act of spiritual creation, the scriptures take on a much more full meaning. And these are the things that sometimes get lost in translation. Unfortunately, our English language does not quite take into account the depth and multidimensional aspect of the Hebrew language. So let's take a look. In he, uh, excuse me, Ether 12, they give us an exposition on or a discourse on faith. And I really like this particular one because it is, it's very comprehensive. But let's take a look at this a little closer because this is the backdrop behind the idea of, you know, the disciplines of the ancient meditations as well as bonding with God. 
So in Heal, excuse me, in Ether 12, verse 6, it says, And now I, Moroni, would speak somewhat concerning these things. I would show unto the world that faith is things which are hoped for, and not seen. Wherefore, dispute not, because you see not. For you receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. You know, in our modern tongue, uh, we often read over this. We think it's, it, it kind of says something in our minds. We often hear something like this. And uh, now I'm a I would speak somewhat concerning these things. I would show unto the world that faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. Well, you know, wherefore, dispute not because you see not, for you receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. And then we visualize faith as if I just believe enough, if I have enough, uh, you know, if I squint my eyes and grin and bear it and lay an egg, somehow it's going to happen. Um, not quite. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not even close to the idea of what true faith is in the ancient Israelite context. So if we were to look at faith as, which is its truest definition, as an act of creation or spiritual creation, then it begins to reveal unto us the hidden dimensions of the text in the Book of Mormon. For example, Let's 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 take a look at this as if we were examining this scripture from this aspect. I would show unto the world that acts of spiritual creation or manifestation is or are established upon are, are established upon are expectations, hope, expectations based on a promise. See, hope in, in Israelite context is not wishful thinking. It's an expectation based on a promise. So I would show unto the world that, a, that spiritual creation or manifestation, faith, is established upon, ex, there, upon expectations that are based on promises and not seen. Dispute not because you see not, for you receive no witness until after the forging or formation of your spiritual creation. In other words, when we engage in faith, we are engaging in spiritual creation, very similar to a blacksmith forging something. Or forming something. That's why the idea of trial of your faith is not grin and bear it or suffer till you make it or he who dies in the most pains wins. It's the idea of you are spiritually forging something. So faith, spiritual creation, spiritual formation or forging produces the, 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 the fruits or the creations of faith or spiritual creation. It's what happens where the spiritual creation begins to bring forth the natural. In other words, we create spiritually, we forge it, and then it manifests in this natural world. So let's take a look at the scriptures and see how it begins to deepen our understanding of faith when we understand it as an act of spiritual creation. So let's continue with verse 7. For it was by an act of spiritual creation that Christ showed himself unto our fathers after he had risen from the dead. And he showed not himself unto them until they had created and acted in him. Wherefore, it must needs be that some had created and acted, for he showed himself not unto the world. But because of the spiritual creation of men, he has shown himself unto the world and glorified the name of the Father and prepared a way that they might, that thereby others might be partakers of the heavenly gift, which is what? That they may have an expectation for, or hope, expectation for those things which they have not seen. Wherefore, you may also have an expectation and be partakers of the gift if you will but act in a spiritual creation or begin to spiritual create. Behold, it was by acts of spiritual creation that they of old were called after the holy order of God. Wherefore, by an act of spiritual creation slash manifestation was the law of Moses given, but in the gift of his son, God has prepared a more excellent way. And it is by acts of spiritual creation that, has been, that it has been established or manifested. In other words, and I'm not, when I use these words, I'm not talking about what you hear in the idea of a uh, manifestation or the secret you know new age movement that kind of thing um, that is so far removed and, and stripped from torah it's unbelievable in this it, it, in this concept everything here centers in the messiah everything centers in the word of god so remember when we are actively creating something everything centers in that 
Everything centers in him. And so we create through him. He being not only the example, but the one who paved the way, led the way, and is the way. So it's the idea behind this is that we are engaging in acts of spiritual creation based upon expectations that we have been given based on promises or the word of God. He goes on. For if there be spiritual uh, spiritual creation among the children of men, if, should be, should be, excuse me, if there be no spiritual creation among the children of men, God can do no miracle among them. Wherefore, he showed not himself until after they engaged in spiritual creation. Behold, it was an act of spiritual creation of Amul, Alma and Amulek that caused the prison to tumble to the earth. Behold, it was the spiritual creation of Nephi and Lehi that wrought the change upon the Lamanites that they were baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost. Behold, it was the spiritual creation of Ammon and his brethren which wrought so great a miracle among the Lamanites. Yes, and even all those who wrought miracles wrought them by acts of spiritual creation, even those who were before Christ and also those who were after. And it was by act the acts of spiritual creation that the three, three disciples contained, or obtained a promise that they should not taste of death. And they obtained not the promise until after they had spiritually created it. And neither at any time hath any wrought miracles until after their acts of spiritual creation. Wherefore, they first believed in the Son of God. And to believe in the Son of God isn't, isn't just a mental assent that he is. In ancient Israelite thought, to believe in the Son of God is the idea of you are walking in his path. You are doing what he did. It's literally, uh, it's the idea of a disciple who believes his rabbi carrying out the words of the rabbi. And if there were many, and there were many whose in, engagement in spiritual creation manifestation that was so extremely, that was so exceedingly strong, even before Christ came, who could not be kept from within the veil, but truly saw with their eyes the things which they had beheld with an eye a spiritual creation or with a spiritual eye and they were glad and behold we have seen in this record that one of these was the brother of jared for so great were his actions of spiritual creation manifestation of god that when god put forth his finger he could not hide it from the sight of the brother of jared because of his word which he had spoken unto him which word he had obtained by engaging in acts or spiritual creation and after the brother Jared had beheld the finger of the Lord, because of the promise which the brother of Jared had obtained through spiritual creation, the Lord could not withhold anything from his sight. Wherefore, he showed him all things, for he could no longer be kept without the veil. This is the idea is the backdrop. The idea of spiritual creation and faith or, or faith is the backdrop behind what we have been talking about so far, which was commenced by discussing the mystery of Hagoth. You know, this is the backdrop behind the meditations, the practices of and disciplines of meditation given in the Book of Mormon, which were lead us, which were to lead us to a bonding experience with God. And here, this is where we get the idea where we talked about Hagoth being meditations. So, for example, what did Hagoth mean? Well, we find its meaning couched in Psalm 49.3. And my mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. Here the word for meditation is the Hebrew word hago, which and it comes from the root word haga, meaning to growl, meditate, or the growling of a lion. The usage of the word would draw the Israelite reader to the ancient teaching called the roaring of the lions. Now, this ancient teaching of the roaring of lions I discussed in another particular episode, but it is the idea, and we'll discuss it even fuller later, but it's the idea of, that is connected to the language of angels. And this is the language of power that God gave unto Enoch. For so powerful was the language that God gave to Enoch that not only the elements obeyed him, but the giants stood afar off. <clears throat> we also discussed how 
as we went along this process of, of the disciplines, that the disciplines uh, or the meditations given in the Book of Helaman follow the path given in uh, to Nephi, where he talks about the gate by which you should enter is baptism. So we're going to talk about the first meditation, which was the gate. And it says here, thus we see, and this comes from Helaman 3, 27 to 28. So we discussed that this particular verse giving us our key of what the gate is. Thus we may see that the Lord is merciful unto all who will in sincerity of their hearts call upon his holy name. Yes, thus we see that the gate of heaven is open unto all, even to those who will believe on the name of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. Now notice here the parallelism. Thus we may see that the Lord, okay, the Lord parallels the gate of heaven. The gate of heaven is the Lord. Now what does that mean? Well, remember, his holy name is Yehovah, or Yehovah, or Yahweh, if it's, if it's the priestly pronunciation. And there's always a big uh, dispute over the centuries of the pronunciation of the name. You'll hear things like Yehovah, you'll hear things like Yahweh, you'll hear things like Yahuwah, you'll, think, you'll hear versions such as Yahweh. And the truth be told, no one really knows um, for sure these days. But the idea behind it um, that I think goes beyond the, the all the name calling is uh, the name represents a condition or state of being. It is a condition or state of being that is a, in an upper world above these things which we call time or prophetic past, prophetic present, or prophetic future. In other words, the name represents a condition. And as we call upon the name, we are entering into that condition where our spirits ascend, if you will, or we enter into a state of consciousness or spirit that is above past, present, future, the place where God exists and where uh, you know, where we come into fuller contact with him in that condition. So by calling upon the name, we are entering into the gate of heaven. Now, this is the backdrop behind the idea of the gate of heaven and baptism. Baptism is the outward expression or ordinance or performance, if you will, that symbolizes a not only a rebirth, but also a change in our state of consciousness, a change in our spirit, where we are elevated. We begin to rise up or ascend up the ladder of heaven. So the outward performance is this, but is connected to this discipline of calling upon the name. Calling upon the name is the foundation of all meditations, all meditations given in the Israelite culture, all go back to the idea of the name, whether it be in the Aleph prayer, that we talked about in the prior episodes, whether it be in the fire meditation or anything else, everything centers back into the name. So when a person calls upon the name, Yud, He, Vav, He, one of its intonations was Yahweh. And in episode six, we, just, we, we gave an example, a musical example of the intonation of God's name from uh, Jonathan Goldman which I thought he did a very great job at using the priestly pronunciation, the vowel intonation of God's name. And it became a, it was, this was a meditative discipline, a bonding discipline where our thoughts of our, our thoughts, our desires and our emotions. Okay. Our will, our thoughts, desires, and emotions combine into one. And the idea behind it is that as we, bring these aspects together, these things become illuminated. We become filled and we're entering in by the gate, which is why it says, for the gate by which you should enter is the repentance, is repentance and the baptism by water. Well, what is the gate? Well, the name of the Lord is the gate of heaven. And this led us to the idea of ascending to Mount Shelem. In the Book of Ether, it actually contains the symbolic and very detailed meditation of calling upon the name, where their brother Jared ascended Mount Shalom and formed eight vessels, 
were eight, you know, transparent stone. Well, excuse me. He, he, they were going to form eight vessels, but they formed 16 transparent stones. Uh, 16 being, again, the symbol for uh, the Yud and the Vav of God's name. And you'll again go back into episode 6 and you'll see a much more fuller discussion of this. But the idea of ascending to Mount Shalem, Shalem is being a peace offering. This is where we are entering into a state or condition to receive from God. It is that timeless state. It is above past, present, and future. It is what the practice or discipline of calling upon the name leads us to experience, that state of timelessness and bonding and connection with God, a state of covenantal peace, that of which our baptism is the, the first steps along that path. And as part of that first step, the calling upon the name is what puts us in the condition to continue to receive so that we may bestow upon others. But this is why the ancient, these meditations are also connected to the ancient sacrifices, because these meditations, in this case, calling upon the name, is what would be, you know, related to the idea of the peace offering in ancient Israel. We also discussed in a prior episode about the nature of this practice of bonding with God. That is something that is beyond human intellect, human language, and the understanding of the fallen man. In other words, this is, this is the understanding of why they would make statements in the scriptures of um, things were so great and marvelous that they were too, uh, they were, they were too great, the humans could not talk, you know, they couldn't speak it, or that it was unlawful to be uttered, not because they were breaking a law if they uttered it per se, it was because it was lawful to be uttered because the human language did not have the power to even express. This is why we have such a feebleness or weakness in our languages, because we no longer have the full power to express these things that are meant to be experienced. Now, Enoch's language did, and that is a language that we're, you know, will come back. But the idea behind it, this language of angels, um, this process is what leads us to it. So the idea of calling upon the name, well, it's a practice that engages the spiritual child of God, which is connected with the Father. In other words, our spirits are, are from him. We're part of him. We have a connection to him. And it never is never broken unless we ourselves willingly choose to break it. By engaging in this practice, the person or persons, a group of people, become a conduit between heaven and earth, so that in healing others, we ourselves are also healed. In other words, all of these things, the, the backdrop of all of this is that these are, these are the things that are meant to be practiced to receive, to bestow, to love God, and to love your neighbor. In other words, this isn't about satisfying our egos, becoming great men or women, trying to have high callings, rise up the social ladder of whether it be the church or the uh, social ladder of America or any other nation for that matter. Um, it is the idea that we are being conduits or vessels that God fills and we take the, that which God gives us and we bless him and bless others or we love him and love others. It's the same concept. And again, all of this is in and through Messiah. So this led us to the pillar of fire meditation, which is, you know, we see this same visualization given in the Exodus. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them in the way, and by night in a, in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. It was the idea, this, this visual aspect, the pillar of fire meditation is connected with the baptism or immersion in fire and the Holy Ghost. It is equated in ancient Israel with what we call the free will offering. Well, how do we know this? Well, besides ancient Jewish tradition and Israelite tradition, uh, the idea here is let's take a look at what is said in Helaman 5, as we discussed in a prior episode. And now the man's name, this is the gentleman who spoke when the fire, when Nephi and Lehi were encompassed by fire in the prison. And the man's name was Aminadav. And the man, you know, says some interesting words. And again, go back and take a look at those words. It says, 
They do con it says, said to them, they do converse with angels. And it came to pass that the Lamanite said to him, what shall we do that this cloud of darkness may be removed from overshadowing us? And then he begins to say something of how they should call upon the name even until they have, uh, even can have faith in Christ. But it's the idea of submission. The idea of making this, this meditation is similar to or, or connected to a free will offering. So Ami, the people, Nadav, the free, is a free will offering. So a pe person or people's free will offering, if you will. And notice the relation to, as we talked about earlier, to Shelah was a peace offering. So we have a, here we have calling upon the name, being connected to the idea of a peace offering, and uh, calling upon the name in the fire meditation, this particular meditation being connected to the idea of the free will offering. So as you can see, you're beginning to see a pattern of deep connection between the practices of bonding with God and the symbolic meaning of the sacrifices in the Torah and the Old Testament. So this meditation is quite powerful because what it powerful what it is meant to do is to it is a healing meditation. It is designed to heal us from the effects of sin and iniquity. Now, not that we do this ourselves. It, it you know the only thing we do is put ourselves in this meditation in a position to receive to bestow. In other words. We're putting ourselves as a vessel. We're, we're making ourselves a vessel to receive. And the moment we do, God instantly fills it to the degree that our vessel can hold. And then we grow in grace, going from grace to grace, receiving grace for grace. Or we grow in our grace as our ability or our capacity to bless others grows. Okay? So in other words, the focus of this meditation is to visualize and to direct the fire of God. Now that sounds strange, but remember, this is a spiritual creation. It's a spiritual act of discipline. So in this case, the pillar of fire is the fire of God. It's the Holy Ghost. It's the glory of God, the Shekinah. So it is an act of engagement, an action of spiritual creation, faith, whereby healing and blessing take place. In fact, in ancient Israelite lore and tradition, it was taught that a person that engaged in this, that the fire would spin off, if you will, and the, the flames of fire that came off it would heal those it came in contact with. This is the, the idea of a high priest who engaged in this, uh, or a, any of the priests engaged in it, they would engage in this practice, or those in the schools of the prophets would engage in this practice, that by healing others, they would heal themselves. That by healing the, the earth, they would heal themselves. Interesting thought that, in other words, everything is, notice that everything, well, is not an outside in, it's an inside out process. And it's not a natural man or egomaniac idea. It, it's a spiritual child of God idea to bless and love and uplift and to receive, to bestow upon others. It's not about lifting ourselves up above others. It's about becoming a servant to heal and transform others and in doing so in doing so as an act of love we become transformed in the inner man so in this idea of a fire meditation we open a conduit for the blessings of God of God and we become vessels and this is also related to the idea and we'll talk about this later even more so in detail of the Merkava or chariot chariot meditations or Merkava meditations that you see in the ascension of like say Elijah or Ezekiel but the and again it's connected to that. But the purpose of this is notice that we're following a steady path. We're not jumping from point A to point B. We're starting off first by getting ourselves disciplined and calling upon the name. And in doing that, the Spirit of God begins to invigorate us and change us. As we grow in our capacity, we begin to as we call upon the name and enter into that bonding state or that meditative state, then we, folk, we begin to spiritual create within ourselves the idea of being purified and healed by God and purification and healing of others. So this is the nature of the pillar of fire meditation. If the idea behind it was that just as the fire uh, separated Israel from Pharaoh and his armies, which came out of Egypt, uh, in a sense, it's kind of like Israel representing the spiritual man of God 
or the spiritual woman of God too, being separated and defended and healed even, if you will, from Pharaoh and his armies, which symbolize in many ways, not only the, the effects and trials and tribulations of this world, the Mitzrayim, but uh, the also the ego, the natural man. So the pillar of fire meditation is an act of creation. It is something that we engage in to be able to connect and bond with God to create an inside out transformation, an inside out healing. So this is part eight of the Beholding Eternity series. Um, next time we're going to go into, which is part nine, what the, the, the rungs of the ladder we are meant to ascend as described in Helaman six and seven, um, that by some of the words that are symbolized there. These are the rungs of Jacob's ladder. These will be the rungs of the tree of life that we are meant to ascend. And it's quoted quite, quite artistically in that particular book. And so understand that in everything that we've discussed, the whole purpose of this up behind all of this is that we're to understand that the meditations are disciplines. These disciplines enable us to engage in acts of spiritual creation. Like God created the earth spiritually before it manifested physically, we are creating spiritually before it will manifest physically. And in doing so, we grow from grace to grace. And in doing so, we, know, we, we go from hear you know hearing the voice of god and being influenced by him to seeing the finger of god like the brother of jared till we grow to a point where we come into the fullness of his presence it's a pathway it's a journey but it's also a disciplined journey and nothing no, nothing is manifest naturally in this world until it is first created spiritually and in many ways this is why imagery and other things are so powerful because the images we imbibe, the images we, we, we practice and imbibe and take into ourselves, uh, we begin to produce. Whether it be television, images on television, the more we imbibe, meditate upon them, bond with them, we, we'll produce them naturally. Same thing when a person goes to a general conference. They imbibe the words or images given by the leaders. And what do they do? Sooner or later, if they take them in enough, they'll begin to produce those things. So it's the same thing with the word of God. We imbibe it, we meditate upon it, we discipline ourselves in it, we produce it. It's just as real, and it's meant to culminate in a physical creation. And this is also why Genesis 1 is so powerful, because it has less to do with a historical account and more to do with teaching us the foundations of faith.